Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Um, just give me a sign that you yes. can hear me. Okay, uh, my name is Francesco Pignatelli, and I'm leading the digital government research team at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to introduce today this event, where almost 200 participants uh, registered despite the summer holidays period still ongoing. Actually, I just returned yesterday from my vacation, and this is the best way to be back to work again. Today's webinar, in fact, will give us an overview of the results of the important work conducted in the area of digital government transformation by the JRC. With our partner DGs, both Digit and Connect, in the last two years, but also we set the stage for the new research and policy support we have defined for the future. Our unit, the digital economy, is addressing its research on understanding the social, technical, economic impact of the digital transformation and the implication of the economy and society, and ultimately the citizen. We are also in particular focusing on how data-driven governance is changing the way public service delivery are designed and how policy can embrace digital innovation in a complex world. Within this context, as part of the LISE action of the ISA Square program, we launched in 2018 a new research on exploring digital government transformation in the EU, understanding uh, uh, public sector innovation in a data-driven society, in short, DigiGov, and the aim was to investigate more in depth the interplay between digital technology and other factors transforming government operations and to pave the way to in-depth analysis of the effect that can be generated by digital innovation in public sector organization and how to assess their social and economic impact. So the research has produced many interesting findings and the final report. Summarizing the entire research outcomes and the policy brief that are also being published and will be available soon. Thus, I would like to thank the research uh, consortium composed by PPMI, Open Evidence, Politecnico di Milano, around Europe and Martel Innovate for the extraordinary work done, as well as Gianluca for orchestrating the research as scientific and project leader for the JRC. In addition, an important result of DigiGov has been the establishment of a community of experts and practitioners that has contributed to the validation of the research activities and will continue also after the end of this uh, research. This also helped us restructuring our own research agenda. In fact, the digital project has been instrumental in the last few years to accompany also our internal policy reorientation and the preparation for our future work program 21-22 that in fact is now centered on digital transformation of governance and public sector innovation. Indeed, the result of DigiGov research that will be presented later by Gianluca resonate very well with the need of, for governments to gently change their modus operandi to address the challenges that the rapid pace of the digital transformation of society is raising, especially now in light of COVID-19 pandemic and at the moment in which the government action plan is coming to an end and the new policy on digital government and revised interoperability strategy are being designed as part of the Digital Europe program. So, Natalia Aristimunos Perez from uh, Digit and the Almos from Connect will definitely tell us more about this during the high level panel discussion that will follow the webinar and that will debate on how to shape digital government transformation in the future, 2030-2040. To get this part to travel into the future, I give now the floor to Gianluca, who will present the digital result, including the future scenarios developed as part of the research project, and who will then moderate the panel discussion, where we will have the pleasure to have with us also uh, Vincenzo Aquario, from uh, Division of Public Institution and Digital Government of the United Nations, and also Barbara Baldi of OECD, who I'm sure don't need any uh, presentation. Thanks, uh, and uh, I give you the floor, Gianluca. 
Grazie Francesco, thanks, uh, thanks to everyone to be here today. So we are very uh, pleased to, to add uh, such, uh, such an interest uh, despite the, the, uh, the still the holiday period. Uh, but um, I mean, I personally wanted to, to, to share with you the, the recent results, or actually anticipated results of what we will uh, uh, publish soon in our final report and we'll present in some events in, uh, in September. Um, so in fact, as, uh, as Francesco mentioned, uh, we will do a, in, the last, in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes an excursion into the future up to 2040 actually. But before to do that, I saw already, I'm very pleased there are some, uh, some um, former colleagues that have joined, including my first head of unit at JRC, uh, because uh, I think we have to learn also from the past. And so I will also do a bit of an excursion into the, the future we envisioned 10 years ago, before, of course, uh, going then to the current, uh, um, let's say, policy debate and see what are implications for future policy and research. So, as I said, uh, and this is not new for uh, for um, for GRC and who has been working with GRC in the in the in the last uh, 20 years at least, uh, because we, uh, we've been uh, focusing on uh, foresight and future-oriented technology analysis since the beginning. And uh, uh, now this is uh, recognized as the highest level of uh, policy making because uh, uh, the von der Leyen Commission as uh, a vice presidency uh, under uh, um, uh, Vice President Shevkovich that focus specifically on foresight. But we do this, of course, under the leadership also of Maria Gabriel, the Commissioner for Research, Innovation and Education. And in fact, uh, these are very interconnected topics also of interest to public sector and the innovation in the public sector. So, and some of you may already seen this slide that we developed uh, 10 years ago, exactly in, uh, um, in Seville, when we, did, we made some uh, scenario building for uh, uh, Digital Europe, uh, the horizon 2030. And we were assuming that uh, uh, society will, uh, um, let's say society will change uh, either to be more open or less open and uh, uh, the integration of technology will make policy making more or less intelligence, uh, intelligent. And uh, this was because uh, there was some signals of sh change or even paradigmatic shift that we have seen uh, since uh, the, the, the first day in the first decade of 2000 with the emergence of social media and, uh, and um, Facebook, of course. I remember with, uh, with Dave Broster that uh, we, we made this kind of uh, um, anticipation of who was coming as person of the year in Time Magazine every year. And then we saw, in fact, the Twitter revolution or so-called Twitter revolution in the Arab Spring in 2011. And then 2012, the first day in office, Obama signed the Open Gov Bill that actually made this uh, becoming uh, more or less the new normal. So it's just a matter of change changing our behavior and our society. Well, after a few years, we see that we're still at the, at the, uh, let's say at the middle of this battle. And after that, we had uh, Angela Merkel, uh, Trump, uh, uh, and others that are not necessarily uh, representing, uh, um, let's say, openness in technological terms. Although uh, then in the recent past, uh, we have seen, uh, uh, although it was not real, but actually uh, the person of the year time magazine could have been a blockchain or definitely artificial intelligence as last year it became the, the most important uh, uh, keyword uh, uh, talked in every conference and policy circle. We also did uh, actually colleagues in Brussels of the GRC Policy Lab, U Policy Lab, uh, I also contributed to uh, um, another scenario building exercise uh, uh, that uh, resonate very much with the, the crossroad one I mentioned before, uh, building on the fact that uh, either tech giant or, uh, or uh, autocratic government could take the lead or we could have a kind of do-it-yourself democracy or, a, or a regulatory system. Now, um, the question is still uh, open, so the jury is still, uh, uh, is still uh, there to, to decide uh, what actually is uh, the potential impact of ICT enable innovation to transform governance and policy making. And that's why in 2018, when I joined the Digital Economy Unit, uh, um, we actually went back to think about the future, knowing well that prediction is a very difficult uh, 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 thing to do, especially if it is about the future, as Niels Bohr was used to say. Now, the DigiGov project, uh, um, uh, let's say, build on a decade at least of uh, uh, declaration on, on uh, e-government from the first uh, uh, Malmo um, Action Plan uh, uh, Ministerial Declaration on Open and Trusted Government, and then through the various uh, ministerial events that uh, brought to the Tallinn Declaration on User-Centric e-Government, and then uh, in the recent uh, um, 
hypothesis that in the end Helsinki they, uh, they focus on human centric digital government somehow to uh, to, as a, as a uh, linking to the AI discourse on human centric uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and now, of course, with the emergence of the new pandemic society, the new digital strategies uh, has uh, clearly uh, showed how uh, it is crucial for uh, AI adoption to be embedded into government and public sector innovation. Now, the objectives of the project, uh, uh, I won't go too much into detail, of course, what will go more in depth in the interplay between digital technology and the other factors that are actually uh, transforming government operation and policy making in a data driven society, because it would be naive to think that technology after 20 years of looking at this topic uh, would be uh, per se uh, the transforming agent, the change agent uh, in a governance. Uh, and then the outcome was uh, to gain a better understanding of uh, the expected outcome uh, was uh, this, uh, uh, also to see how new approaches to use data for policy design service delivery could actually help uh, policy makers to address uh, uh, better uh, the systemic problems uh, that actually the current outbreak of the COVID also showed uh, in all in uh, its uh, entirety and complexity. And that's why also the, the action of research and policy recommendation that we designed uh, are uh, in line with the, with the new uh, policy direction of the Commission for the years to come. So as um, it was mentioned by Francesco, we have uh, um, uh, been supported in this activity by, by a consortium uh, that made an excellent work from, uh, uh, led by PPMI and, and uh, composed by various uh, uh, members from Open Evidence, from Tecno Milano and Europe and Martel. And we actually uh, did uh, our own work first uh, to make a, a systematization of the knowledge base, the very rich knowledge base that we have uh, in this uh, field that is not a new field, but we try to look at it uh, exactly uh, from the multidimensional aspect of uh, digital government and public sector innovation. And we conducted uh, um, a systematic uh, literature review, but also an analysis of the policy and the practice in the field and uh, developed a conceptual framework and, and um, that has been tested uh, against uh, uh, real life uh, case studies and uh, experiments. I'll be back briefly on that. But very important, we also engage the community, as it was mentioned before, uh, both uh, uh, practitioners, stakeholders, uh, um, representative and uh, uh, experts that were very uh, instrumental in uh, uh, finalizing the, the framework and the concept of, and, the, and the policy and research recommendations. So as I said, uh, we have found uh, after this analysis of uh, um, a decade of, uh, of literature in the, in the field in different areas, uh, 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 not only from an ICT perspective, uh, the, that there is still a limited, uh, uh, quite limited, robust empirical evidence on what are the effects of digital government transformation, especially when it comes uh, not to the usual productivity gains or, or efficiency and effectiveness, but rather on what is less measurable, like inclusion, legitimacy, and participation. So the more soft political issues that are uh, um, becoming more and more important uh, for restoring also the trust between the citizens and, uh, and, um, and the policymakers. And uh, in this respect, uh, um, we also um, try to unveil what is the path to digital government uh, that is not necessarily a revolution all the time. It goes from simple to more complex forms of governing and has different stages of readiness and maturity uh, that uh, not necessarily go in a linear mode, but actually integrate feedback loops and that's why we need to consider also and embrace actually the complexity of the governance and service uh, uh, service delivery transformation and going beyond the, the, the techno optimism that has often uh, um, characterized the literature in the field uh, uh, creating sometimes some, uh, some utopian or dystopian uh, uh, um, configuration of digital uh, innovation. Um, so um, the other, um, and, and this is published uh, in, a, in a report uh, that actually um, uh, has been um, released in 2019, uh, that uh, um, has been coupled by another report that we published recently in May, uh, that uh, present more in detail so the, the conceptual framework that we have developed, uh, as well as the case studies and experiment that, are, um, that will illustrate what could be the possible impacts of the digital transformation in different contexts and phases of the policy cycle. Uh, this, uh, that we call it uh, in the DigiGov F, the DigiGov framework, uh, uh, is not, of course, a theoretical uh, uh, framework, but it aims to contribute to systematizing and reconceptualizing the, uh, the, the phenomenon of digital government transformation within public sector innovation and help uh, um, understand better and pave the way for more in-depth assessment uh, uh, that could be then uh, um, operationalized into more practical uh, toolkits. 
Um, now here, um, I won't go into details, but basically uh, there are two important elements that we need to consider. One, we started from what are called the literature, the innovation and precedence, and how this could affect uh, from external and from internal uh, um, perspective, the, the, the change strategies and the digital government that has changed strategies within the government, and the need to reframe public sector innovation. That means uh, um, reconsidering, uh, rethinking the, the, the cognitive uh, routine and behaviors that are uh, intrinsic in the, in the governance uh, in the public sector. Uh, we started with the first uh, um, framework that has been then uh, discussed with experts uh, and then uh, um, uh, generated a more complex, uh, um, let's say, um, uh, uh, framework that uh, looks at the uh, embrace the complexity uh, theories approach and uh, um, uh, develop also a typology of uh, uh, digital innovation based on uh, the reach and the depth of digital uh, government uh, uh, strategies and innovation in the public uh, uh, sector. Um, so I won't go much into details as, as, um, uh, as um, we have also uh, in, the, in the webinar Professor Colagnone that supported me as, the, as a scientific um, coordinator of the consortium so maybe in the discussion session if possible we, we can also go deeper into these or the results of the of the case studies that actually um, has been also a, a pioneer uh, I would say in, in this area because it's not uh, uh, usual to have uh, um, experimental or quasi experimental approaches uh, to case studies uh, in this field uh, so we selected uh, uh, four cases uh, that we uh, then uh, um, analyzed uh, in depth uh, and the report I mentioned before to, um, uh, include the, all, the, all the details uh, 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 of the results. Um, and one was uh, the Quarkao Vilnius um, platform uh, for citizen engagement in Vilnius that shows that of course by uh, providing the platform per se is not sufficient of course to generate uh, uh, participation and this requires uh, uh, um, uh, an integration of uh, the civil society and uh, NGOs in this case that was uh, definitely a, a key driver of success. So, um, we also start, looked at the 4D world cameras uh, um, phenomenon in uh, both UK but also in the uh, US and in other countries in Europe through secondary uh, review of literature. And uh, um, basically here we also saw that uh, uh, clearly this, this technology has an enormous potential but at the same time uh, is still not uh, um, conclusive the evidence on, uh, on the, uh, let's say, the a positive effect in terms of legitimacy and trust uh, increase uh, in, uh, in, um, in the police in this case. Um, we also looked at the case in the area of education and, mo and sustainable mobility that bit, uh, uh, let's say, um, not necessarily at the core of the, of the e-government, the traditional government, uh, through a, a, a pilot project uh, um, developed by the Fondazione Bruno Kessler and uh, tested uh, uh, in Trento and Ferrara, uh, where we saw also that in this case, uh, through gamification, uh, um, that there is an increase of the inclusion and uh, also the, the, um, the literacy in terms of, uh, of changing the also behavior uh, for, uh, for mobility, uh, sustainable mobility, of, um, also reinforcing the tie between the children, the, the, the parents and the, um, and the, the, school, um, the school actors. And finally, we have conducted uh, an online experiment uh, in uh, Germany and Spain with, uh, with 1,400 uh, participants in, in an online user panel, and where we um, hypothesized the four uh, um, hypothetical, uh, uh, we designed four hypothetical uh, um, cases of new digital uh, services in the area of health, uh, um, data protection, uh, transport, uh, uh, and, um, um, and also we show that uh, the, uh, the level of trust uh, is different uh, in, uh, in different uh, areas. Uh, but also, uh, most important, uh, is not necessarily the public sector, the, let's say the, 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 let's say the trustee or the most trustee, uh, as uh, often uh, um, in some cases uh, citizens prefer a third party or, uh, or uh, let's say an independent body to, to, to gather their personal data, especially in some sensitive areas. Um, as I say, the very important part of the, the research was the engagement uh, with experts and stakeholders. Uh, this was done in two large workshops in, uh, in uh, Ispra and in Seville, uh, where uh, we also um, used the policy lab uh, uh, approach to actually engage the, the, the participants. And this is also uh, published uh, in, a, in a report that, we, uh, that was uh, released last week. Um, so just to conclude uh, this part, uh, we, I mean, we want to summarize in three, uh, three uh, 
points, the lessons learned, uh, and how to define the framework conditions for innovating governance models and uh, have new design for policy. Uh, clearly, on one side, we need to enable the technological conditions for that openness and sharing, uh, but also we have to manage what I, uh, I mean, since many years we call the governance with and of ICT so that we can really unleash uh, this institutional redesign. And this, of course, uh, with the opportunity that data power intelligence system allows today for better evidence based policy making. Now, um, getting to the future again, as part of the prospective uh, part of the, the research, uh, we, um, we of course looked more uh, specifically onto the, the AI um, predictive and cognitive technologies that are now at the center of our digital uh, transformation of society. So I won't go too much into details. I'm sure you are all aware of some of the policy um, work uh, and the research we are also uh, contributing to um, but clearly there is from uh, from um, i would say from the industry and from some research uh, a kind of uh, um, techno deterministic uh, uh, dream that super ai will realize uh, a singularity at a certain point or actually very soon uh, but we're not actually sure that expectations are coupled with the social political trends we we witness uh, uh, every day and especially now within the uh, within the aftermath or the or the stand the, the within the core of the of the COVID emergency crisis. So, uh, clearly, there are two main dimensions of concern that emerge that are not new also, but are now actually stressed maybe to a different dimension. The role of the state vis-a-vis -vis the market, so who actually will govern, if possible, the digital transformation, and what is the level of the individual data protection. Uh, clearly, this is a debate uh, that uh, um, is very hot. Uh, as I said, we had uh, an online uh, Duke COVID uh, foresight workshop that uh, was quite interesting and um, with over 50 participants and uh, we managed to really have an uh, interactive discussion and we presented some uh, extreme uh, um, and talk provoking scenarios from a government-led to a market-led or a more uh, dystopian uh, surveillance or utopian governments uh, and clearly there was a discussion that allowed us to uh, to generate insight that we then uh, use to finalize to refine and finalize the scenarios so the scenarios that we will uh, um, present in our final report. So this is a kind of a premiere because it's the first time we are uh, presenting in public. Uh, uh, will uh, resonate according to two main dimensions of impact. On one side, uh, we look at the digital transformation landscape that goes from uh, a more regulated interventionist approach to a more unregulated uh, list affair, if you want uh, um, a perspective, uh, where actually the, the regulatory framework here is not only the legal, the legal um, um, aspect, but actually also the capacity of the public sector and the government to steer uh, the, the digital transformation, so enable a genuine uh, multi-partnership uh, uh, development uh, and innovation uh, um, environment uh, that could then uh, de develop some uh, um, human-centric services. On the other side, we have, the, um, as it is a tradition in foresight, uh, to, to, to oppose a more, uh, let's say, governmental uh, uh, access to a societal one. Look at the digital citizenry, and that goes from a passive uh, uh, to active, uh, um, so where uh, the citizens are in control of their own data, and there is what is now uh, uh, the, the, the hot topic also on the debate of digital sovereignty uh, fully realized in Europe, at least we are looking at this from the, from the European perspective. But clearly, um, we have to remember uh, that a uh, scenario uh, is a possible world, a world that does not have to be uh, yet come to pass, as the future says, because basically here we have to, um, to acknowledge that uh, probably none of the, definitely none of the four scenarios we realize per se, although we have clearly a, a, a kind of a, a more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, preferred one. And in fact, uh, um, among the four uh, scenarios, uh, um, apart from the, 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 the more surveillance uh, control system uh, of state uh, that resonate with the Leviathan governance that we envisioned 10 years ago, uh, we have, uh, uh, due to the COVID in particular today, uh, um, an, a 
approach to more on precautionary uh, principles uh, that could uh, benefit inclusion for us or maybe limit the innovation. On the other side, uh, and if the status quo continues, uh, we have uh, uh, apathetic uh, citizens uh, that uh, could uh, lead to uh, more closed innovation, uh, where the digital uh, um, capacity uh, of citizens is, uh, is limited. Or in the more uh, ideal governance scenario, trust and open innovation take the lead, and this uh, um, could be done by linking actually the, the innovators, so the, the makers and the shapers that are the citizens. And citizens here will be digitally active, uh, but also empowered uh, to manage their own data. And at the same time, uh, um, uh, governments will be capable exactly of steering the that governance uh, uh, framework needed to um, facilitate, uh, stimulate innovation and facilitate the development of uh, uh, human-centric uh, uh, digital services. So coming to, um, to the conclusion part, uh, um, uh, and uh, we have uh, tried, uh, although of course uh, the, the, uh, clearly the, the, the empirical part, the conceptual empirical part of the research was already completed when the, the COVID uh, emergency uh, um, arrived. Uh, the, some of these implications uh, are uh, still uh, valid today, <laughs> of course, uh, and uh, uh, more uh, so. Um, so we have followed uh, one of our experts uh, uh, taught us uh, the rule of seven that in, for the Chinese uh, uh, culture uh, is a lucky number. So we have seven main findings and seven policy recommendations. So on one side we have the, the I mean, acknowledged that through the case studies uh, uh, that there is a, uh, there are limits of automation, especially in the realm of artificial intelligence and of the immediate productivity gains uh, that actually uh, uh, may not be uh, so uh, positive, especially if they are not uh, followed by investments uh, that um, allow to keep the service up and running in the medium to long term. So beyond the, uh, the piloting and the quick wins uh, that uh, requires uh, the reframing, as we mentioned in our conceptual framework of the organizational processes and the institutional design. Um, we also saw through uh, our case studies and, uh, and experiment that uh, there is a strategic importance and uh, of legitimacy and trust, but also this has a twofold nature that could be, uh, of course, uh, um, positive, but also allegedly negative uh, uh, and create the risk that, uh, um, that point to the fact that we definitely need to uh, um, focus more on adoption and user needs, uh, so to avoid uh, increasing the uh, uh, shrinking digital divides. Also, we have to be realistic about uh, the, the, the potential of technology to engage people and uh, have open governance and corporate action. Uh, uh, although, at the same time, uh, there is, an, there is a, a crucial aspect in terms of the aspects uh, that are uh, linked to public value. And as I said several times, also to embrace the complexity of the public sector. So in terms of um, implications for uh, policymakers, uh, uh, we also identified the need to govern this tension between uh, on one side the platformization of, uh, of government that is uh, theorized by many since many, several years now and the distributed network system that the current technology uh, actually uh, could enable. Um, this would also require enforcing what the French uh, uh, School of, uh, of Regulation called the model of, regula of regulation uh, uh, that uh, could enable uh, uh, the potential of the government uh, 4.0. Uh, but to address the risks that are also inherent in this process, we need to develop and, and there is a, a debate currently, especially in Europe, on uh, ethical frameworks to minimize the risk of new technology, uh, while at the same time uh, um, opening access to data, protecting privacy, and of course promoting interoperability. Let's remember that this study is actually um, started between uh, the it's been conducted within the context of the ISA square program so it is important that the, especially in the new um, uh, digital Euro program the interoperability of government uh, um, strategy will uh, take into consideration some of these uh, uh, findings and then of course uh, we need to um, consider the, the need of uh, capacity building in the in the public sector and uh, uh, creating a new digital transformation culture that uh, allows to prioritize public value and align government assistance with the sustainable development goals. And I'm sure that uh, in the panel discussion, we will touch upon this, uh, that is a very important topic to, to discuss, uh, not, uh, not only, let's say, at the UN level, I would say, but actually in Europe, especially now in light of the COVID crisis. So to conclude in terms of future research, because of course as a researcher we are very much interested in what comes next in terms of uh, 
further uh, further investigation, um, uh, it would be need to apply further the the, the, the conceptual framework to empirical uh, cases so that we can uh, better understand uh, what is the innovation, public sector innovation potential of practices, and then promote the not only the scaling up of pilots but also scaling that deep and uh, uh, out so the transferability of these uh, innovative uh, public services, for instance, and also look at data spaces in innovative public services and gov tech uh, uh, to stimulate adoption of innovation public services, and especially uh, with regard to new emerging technologies, uh, potentially disruptive like AI, uh, blockchain, uh, for instance. And also we should uh, study the collab collateral uh, potential positive effects of COVID-19 that uh, um, according to some uh, have been uh, boosting the speed up of uh, and the needed reframing for digital government transformation. Um, this links also to the fact that we should focus more on the public value creation, at, not only at the national level, but also at local and regional uh, um, public administration uh, systems and uh, assessing the impact of specific technologies uh, um, uh, also linking, of course, to the other activities that uh, I'm sure many of you are aware uh, we are conducting the, um, as part of the AI yeah, Watch, for, for instance, or the Innovative Public Service Observatory uh, in collaboration with our partner DGs, uh, especially Digital Net and Digital, uh, that are also here represented today in the, in the panel discussion. And they were clearly instrumental in uh, um, giving uh, us uh, guidance uh, for uh, um, linking uh, 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 and bridging the science of the policy. Uh, um, that is what we have tried to do in this, uh, especially in the last uh, part of the, of the research. And uh, um, so to conclude, uh, what is next uh, is, uh, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, the final report is now being printed and will be available uh, uh, mid-September. And uh, we are also preparing a policy brief uh, and uh, recommendations that would uh, then uh, allow us uh, to depart at full speed uh, for uh, uh, the future. So um, thank you uh, for uh, the attention. And of course, if there's any question, um, and um, especially the difficult one, uh, there will be also my colleague Cristiano that can answer. Um, I would suggest uh, as uh, I think we have still uh, uh, 15 minutes uh, to gather uh, maybe a couple of questions and comments. I don't know if they are already in the, in the chat. And, uh, um, and then, of course, uh, we could move uh, to the to high level, uh, the high level panel discussion that is scheduled uh, at uh, 15.45. So, and of course, uh, thank you. And uh, if you are uh, interested in, there are some, uh, I think, uh, Simon, you, you did something wrong. Anyway, so there are also the contact person Okay, so here are the, some of the questions, so. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe we can have uh, the, 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 the people presenting and make their questions. I don't know how many, I cannot manage it here now, the screen anymore. So if uh, they want to intervene uh, live, uh, we will be very happy. As this is not, a, a, let's say, a traditional webinar, as we everybody has the same right to speak and uh, and intervene. So, Simon, can you allow the speakers, the, the people that want to intervene? They are allowed, yes. So I know Jana or Martin. Maybe they want to start. I see. Yes. Hello, Gianluca. This is Jana. Hi. 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 Um, so my question is related to your what's next in terms of research. And um, as you mentioned that there are that individual member states are at different starting points when digitalizing and transforming the government uh, or their respective governments. And um, at the moment we are measuring because we are at the capable or empowered in terms of action by data proven uh, methods. So for us um, as public servants and in public service, it's important to have um, metrics. So currently we are using the DESI index, yes, uh, in the public um, sector digitalization. However, I would like to 
understand whether there is a, um, and that's benchmark against the average, yes? Mm -hmm. And um, is there any chance to, in order to show leadership, to include European Commission as a form of administration or an organization and its transformation, digital transformation, uh -huh. and uh, include in the ranking, and as well set the the ideal model or this uh, or model an ideal curve of the digital transformation of uh, of governments given that they are digitally non-native organizations so i think that would be very helpful in terms of digital transformation and data models and uh, actions for for us Okay, thanks, Jana. Well, I'm not sure I, I'm in a position to answer your question. Uh, we have also. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why that's why I'm calling for support uh, from uh, both uh, either colleagues from uh, the Policy DG, that, because it's a very interesting uh, question, but also maybe Cristiano want to get in because he's uh, a very well known uh, expert in measurement and evaluation of uh, of um, e government and digital government. Because I think here it's a more uh, uh, political question that is, of course. It's important to consider not just uh, the member states, uh, rather the EU as a as a whole. And I think uh, this resonates well with the with the approach that in the AI uh, that you are very familiar and linked to the coordinated action plan. So yes. I, um, that would be, of course, uh, personally, I would be much in favor of having this, and I've been uh, probably uh, theorizing this for many years. So the fact that we should have a common, uh, uh, let's say, European public administration. Uh, um, let's say approach, but of course then there are other um, let's say other issues that come to the fore. So, uh, but well, I, I'm not saying that we should have one joint public administration, EU public yeah. administration approach. I'm saying that perhaps it's a way to measure against uh, a, as an alternative to the current benchmark of the EU average. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, I don't know if someone wants to intervene on these. Otherwise, uh, maybe we can go to another question. Um, I, I know that there is a... Francesca, Francesca Freire had a question. Okay. Hi, Gianluca. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. So the, I just, uh, I'm, interested in about, I'm interested about the governance systems and alignment with uh, the SDGs. And so my question is about how do you think this is connected with practical actions that include like uh, schools and students, which for me are the, the, the future uh, global citizens uh, of 2040. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, this is a very important question. I would say that, uh, in fact, I mean, one of our cases is not by accident uh, focusing on the education. And also there is a, quite some inter important work that even the GRC has been doing on looking at the digitalization of, um, of schools and uh, digital education in general. Um, I I've also been involved in the past. But uh, I think uh, going to the SDGs, uh, what is interesting is that uh, there are some SDGs where there is no uh, specific reference to the to ICT, to technology, but they are very much uh, uh, actually uh, potentially enabled by technology. If you look at SDG 16, that uh, looks at the institutional, um, uh, let's say, reforms uh, and democratic, oh, say it's not written democratic, of course, but uh, is a look uh, at the idea to, to link uh, the, the reform of good governance to democratic uh, um, development. Uh, actually, technology can play an important role there. And this cannot be, of course, uh, disconnected by education or other, uh, um, other topics. So but this, again, is a I would say it's a political question uh, because then, of course, if you look at the new strategy, digital strategy of the Commission, uh, this is very much linking uh, also the technological and digital transformation with the Green Deal. And this is also very important in the current, um, in the current uh, uh, situation. So, thanks. So, I don't, uh, I don't know if there's also if there's any other comment or questions also. I think it's one from by Edwin Wiese. Ah, yes. Um, well, my question was, was a bit concrete one. Um, I saw the report, gave an overview of the, the state of the art for, for different themes in uh, for the different member states. And I wondered um, which of the developments can have impact on uh, 
not only the, uh, the digital government of the member states, but on cooperation as well. Recently in the COVID crisis, we've seen that uh, different member states develop their own apps and uh, successful apps. And well, the, the, to me, the question arises, uh, what, what technology would specifically benefit from, uh, from cooperation there? Yeah, and I think this, uh, uh, and I think this resonates also with another question that I see very pleased uh, from uh, Jeremy Miller, but also look at the game changes potential of COVID on society. So I think this is uh, something that, uh, as I said, and uh, I mean, is one of the of the possible future direction of the the, the research uh, is also to consider more in depth uh, uh, that the, exactly the if it is uh, true that uh, that the COVID uh, emergency as a um, uh, let's say accelerating is accelerating the digital uh, transformation and if it's doing this for the, the good or for the bad and clearly some examples uh, of possible cooperation cross-border that is again one of the important uh, uh, focus of the ISA square program and uh, and the work uh, we, we support uh, is uh, uh, could be let's say further strengthened and I think this is um, clear in the uh, in the orientations of the Digital Euro program, where it is called for strengthening the, the, you know, the interoperability focus, not only from a technical perspective, because clearly uh, technology, this is not new, that can be uh, semantically or, oh, I mean, in become interoperable and data can be exchanged according to pr protocols, but uh, it is more a governance issue. So I think this uh, relies very much on the, again, on the on the, the policy making the sphere of the of the of the governance uh, transformation so i think we are getting to the maybe we have a, a very final common question i don't know if someone want to intervene also i mean as many of you are probably aware of this uh, research as was mentioned by francesco is okay is this project is ending here today but there will be new research uh, starting uh, soon and that will focus uh, very much on some of the concrete uh, aspects uh, that have emerged also from this and uh, more specifically on sandboxing of that spaces and also looking at the, at the local and regional level. So we will perhaps discuss this also later with, our, with colleagues of Digit and uh, Connect uh, that um, are also of course uh, leading on these areas. So, um, so Luca, yes, ah, Cristiano, yeah, please. please. Cristiano, yeah, because you <laughs> you mentioned me in the case of the most difficult answer, but a question, but they were not uh, uh, questions that were related uh, directly to very directly to the to the report but uh, on the first one on, on measurement uh, i agree that it's more of a political decision because there are plenty of different uh, benchmarking and in our research we didn't find a, a sort of convergence among scholar on how to measure digital transformation with respect to artificial intelligence just one comment in reply to to um jeremy's comment about the COVID and also uh, edwin there is an interesting report by the GRC. Uh, well, first author is Kralia. Uh, there are many other authors, also Francesco, I think. And they, they say that the COVID is a game changer, but in, in, it increases the potentiality, positive, but also the, the concern. And for instance, in, in terms of, uh, of uh, what happened in the past months, you could, you could see that scientists had a common platform to share data, but cities, and regions did not. And obviously the, 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 the kind of uh, interoperability and geospatial intelligence and solution are those technology that would be most useful for the cooperation. But for this cooperation to take place, there is always something above or before, which is uh, the political decision to make things interoperable. I mean, that's a, a few, uh, comments I, I can add to the to some of the questions. Okay, thanks Cristiano. So also so there was a comment from Dave. Uh, of course I cannot but agree with uh, with him with the fact that we need to focus much on uh, trust. Um, I don't know if you want to say something. Um, I'm also pleased that there are many participants not only from Europe but from all the continent from Brazil, India, Argentina and so forth. So um, 
I don't know if, um, uh, I mean, we have uh, 111 participants at the moment, so that is quite uh, good, so connected. Um, I would uh, not ask uh, for uh, voting on if having a, a break or moving uh, directly to the panel discussion, but as uh, I know that Vincenzo will have to leave uh, 4.30 sharp, I would probably suggest that we uh, move to the panel discussion and then of course you, you can keep uh, commenting, uh, sending us questions and, and critiques as well, uh, very much accepted and, uh, um, and appreciated. And uh, also getting uh, then the discussion, maybe opening again the floor to this. Uh, we'll have a first round for the four uh, participants and the four panelists uh, that I ask uh, to please uh, put uh, maybe their, uh, their uh, video on. So I see Barbara, and uh, meanwhile, I'll prepare for the, oops. Yeah, so Vincenzo, is he, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Okay, so I'm putting your slide on because, okay, I'm, first of all, let me just introduce, I mean, although it was already done by Francesco and uh, I'm sure nobody, of this, the, the panelists need to be introduced, but uh, we have Vincenzo Aquero, that is the Chief of Digital Government of the United Nations uh, uh, DESA, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and is the, 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 the guru of the e-government survey. Uh, we will give us a few insights uh, from the, from the, the recent uh, uh, survey released uh, a month ago uh, with, um, with uh, some focus on Europe. And then uh, um, Natalia Aristimun, Perez, uh, that is the head of the Interoperability Unit, uh, unit or DIGIT, and she uh, to, will give us also some, um, some insights, I guess, on the future. The not so far in the future, but maybe just uh, in, the, in the near future. And Andrea Almos uh, from uh, DigiConnect uh, and uh, um, Ciao Andrea, um, that also has been uh, and say instrumental to, to many of the development in the e-government field in the past and now looking more at the local uh, regional level. And Barbara Baldi that uh, is uh, leading uh, the digital government, well actually now it's changed, but it's digital government open data uh, team or in now a bit changed of the OECD, she will tell us a bit more. Um, okay, so maybe I share my screen again and give to Vincenzo the 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 floor for, I would say, six, five to seven minutes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Gianluca. Uh, while you are uh, sharing the slides, yes, perfect. Uh, so also as Chief of Digital Government Branch uh, of uh, United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, it is really my great honor and privilege to be here today. And I take this opportunity to congratulate with the organizers for this very interesting and inspiring webinar, in particular with the European Commission and with the JRC. My personal and professional acknowledgement goes also to Gianluca for his excellent job done leading the research project and to the research consortium. Distinguished colleagues and experts, ladies and gentlemen, in my few minutes, six minutes, I will present in a nutshell the global and regional mega trends based on the last finding of the 2020 government survey to set up the scene for the panel discussion. I will also introduce some insights from the report to illustrate how digital government has been playing a central role, not only in responding to the COVID-19 crisis, but also for recovery and development. Next slide, please. The survey highlights a persistent positive global trend towards higher level of e-government development. At a glance, the 2020 survey reflects further improvement in global trends in the e-government development and the transitioning of many countries from lower to higher GDI levels. In this edition, 57 countries worldwide have a very high GDI in comparison with the 40 countries in 2018. A total of 69 countries have high GDI and 59 countries have middle GDI. So 65% of uh, United Nations member states are now in the high and very high AGDI groups. Uh, this denotated significant improvement in the level of e-government development around the world. In total, 42 countries recorded positive up for upward movement from a lower AGDI group to a higher one, uh, with only eight countries still in the low AGDI group. 
ne uh, next slide, please. The global average GDI continued to rise, uh, reaching 0 0.6 in 2020 in comparison with 0.55 in 2018. All regions have improved their average GDI since 2018, contributing to an increase to digital development worldwide. It is worthy to notice that Africa and Oceania made notable progress, having increased their GDI by 14%. For this first time, Asia Indus, uh, is the second region in the world in terms of regional GDI, followed by Americas, Oceania and Africa. But despite the significant progress made, uh, still Oceania and Africa uh, have their regional GDI average much below the global average. As you can see, Europe remains the leader in the e-government development with an average GDI uh, uh, of uh, 0 0.82, very high. All countries in Europe have AGDI values above the global average. Next slide, please. The, this table shows that the 14 countries in the highest rating class, that is VH, of the very high AGDI group. So this is the group of the leading countries in the world. Five of these 14 top rating countries in the world are from the European Commission Union. Uh, are, are from the European Union and a total of eight are from uh, Europe. Then we have United States continue to play a leading role in government development in Americas and globally and the Republic of Korea is the global leader in online services provision and is the most advanced performer in Asia with Singapore and Japan. Australia and New Zealand are the front runner of uh, Oceania. None of the countries in Africa are included in the group of the highest rating class. Next slide, please. As a region, Europe has the most homogeneous e-government development. It is also the highest average GDI, as we saw in the previous slides. Of the 43 European countries assessed, this is uh, the, the, uh, the way uh, UN group uh, uh, countries, 33 are in the uh, very high GDI group. And this slide and the next one is about this 33. Denmark has the highest GDI value globally for the second consecutive survey. Estonia recorded the most significant GDI uh, increase and Finland improved it in all uh, three sub indices in the GDI. Both Sweden and the United Kingdom achieved a higher uh, overall GDI through substantial improvement in technical infrastructure component Netherlands, Ireland, and Norway showed improvement in all three GDI sub-indices. And the uh, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Latvia, Croatia, Hungary, and Romania uh, moved from high to very high GDI. Next slide. Uh, participation is a key dimension of uh, governance and one of the pillars of 2030 agenda. As for the other edition of the survey, participation was assessed and ranked and the results present, uh, are presented in chapter five and in the annexes of the report. At regional level, Europe as a whole is the leading region also uh, uh, for e-participation followed by Asia, Americas, Oceania and Africa. So really uh, um, uh, Europe has a, a you know, a strong uh, legacy in terms of also digital cooperation and in terms of uh, promoting digital transformation, not only in 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 uh, in the in Europe in the region, but also worldwide. Uh, last slides, uh, last two slides. Based on the survey, two thirds of the UN member states have already reached a high level of e-government development, and those countries have heavily relied on digital technologies in their COVID-19 pandemic response. Based on survey findings, uh, during the crisis, many countries focused on uh, providing information related to general health uh, precautions and emergency numbers supported by public announcement on national portals. As the crisis intensified, the countries began extending their responses using more social media channels to report on COVID-19 statistics. At a later stage in the crisis, more government started using dedicated COVID-19 portals to centralize the information. Many of them moved forward, uh, further and in partnership with private sector have implemented new services and apps helping in the fight against COVID-19. Next slide. 
the, to summarize, COVID-19 has forced the government and societies to turn toward digital technologies and to stress a multi-stakeholder partnership to respond to the emergencies in the shorter term, to mitigate the socioeconomic repercussions in the mid term, and to mobilize new resources and adapt new regulation, policies, and recovery tools in the long term. But the developing countries cannot afford the crisis and the recovery alone, and more initiatives to strengthen international, regional, national, and multi-stakeholder cooperation need to be put in place to restarting their fragile economies and to rebuilding their societies. The COVID-19 part is covered in details in the addendum of the report. Conclusion. To conclude a few info about the other parts of the survey not covered by this presentation, uh, the government development is a rising priority in a political agenda, also at local level and for municipalities. As part of the 2020 survey process, e-government development were assessed also for 100 cities. This part is covered in chapter four. And uh, with the growing technological capacity to process uh, even larger and more complex data sets, the potential to a more data-centric and data-driven e-government is presented in chapter six. This chapter introduces also the concept of data governance and stresses governments to adopt an holistic, all of government approach in development and uh, overarching data governance framework. Uh, many countries in the world still lack uh, the capacity to leverage digital technology. Developing uh, capacity for e-government become essential as digital government transformation involves far more than the integration of technologies in governance. A holistic framework with empirical pillars for building capacity in digital transformation are presented in chapter seven in the survey. So for more, uh, uh, this is the last one. For a more in-depth analysis, I invite all of you to download our report from the UN DESA portal or to access to our eGov knowledge base. Uh, and I thank you for your attention. I think I was in time. Thank you, Gianluca. Thank you, Vincenzo. And um, yeah, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions, but I will first get to the, the and, and also, I think this is a bit of a premiere of presenting the focus of the of the results on uh, Europe. Uh, that is actually what we uh, discussed uh, at the foresight workshop in uh, in uh, in July. That was exactly the day before uh, the launch of your of your survey. Um, so I will now pass uh, to Natalia, that um, I'm sure can link to this and give us a lot of uh, insight from her privileged uh, viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Gianluca. Um, thank you for, for inviting me to this uh, very interesting uh, panel and, and uh, really challenging discussion that, that, that uh, this uh, brings. Um, I, I won't go through, through, through the whole uh, report that uh, Gianluca, you, you just presented. I want to just to say that this, as you have said, has been uh, very uh, thoroughly uh, done. Um, and I would like to, to, to highlight again uh, the importance of taking into account the different long angles that you, you have taken into account for this report, but not only to look at the possible solutions or the possible future, but also to have the different angles to look at the problems. And I think this is uh, uh, really important. Uh, and we can see that in the output uh, of the report. Uh, it confirms indeed the, the, that uh, the, the digitalization or digitization of the public services is, is more than just technology. And this, well, I think that we that uh, are around the table today and know about that, but uh, this has been really confirmed. And now we really see uh, the value and the importance of looking at the organizational, how, how business processes are organized in the public services, also the governance um, of, of setting up all these uh, processes, but also very important, and this is uh, having an increased uh, focus lately, is the legal aspects. And I can say with, with COVID, for example, we have seen on sometimes uh, how we were um, 
um, we, we could not, we were stopped about uh, evolving with, for example, a solution because some legal aspects didn't allow us to, to move forward. And this is why um, we are looking at all these aspects from, from an interoperability and helping the, the digitization of public services to, to have this global view to look at all the aspects and that we don't introduce uh, um, new barriers when we are looking only from one angle when developing new public services. Um, what I would like also to highlight is the, 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 in the content of this report, the importance of uh, putting together not only um, uh, like uh, research or desk uh, reading and, and looking or doing surveys, but really putting that in, in practice. And for that also, that's part of what we are doing in the ISA Square program where we we try to combine the outputs of studies, but also to put them in practice uh, by implementing um, solutions or running pilots that will help to, to, to learn how to do it for, for the future. So this, I think it's very important to, to really combine these views so that we can really support the journey of the digital public services. I would say that also something that is important and okay, is not really answering the question that was put in the chat on, on the more involvement of, of citizens or so, but I think that now the multidisciplinarity that we are seeing together in running this kind of reports, but also in implementing uh, solutions and, and services, this is really key. And here we have seen that uh, um, Gianluca and the team, they have put together uh, not so academics, practi practitioners, uh, researchers, but also people working in the, in the institutions, in the public services themselves. And this is what really bring value to um, what we are doing. And I think this is a, a real example on how we are changing. And um, even if the digital aspects may be a, a, driving, is a driver, it is also on the mindset and how we work uh, together. And I think that this is a very positive first step, a step to have even more inclusiveness when uh, delivering the public services, but since the beginning, since the design, or as we are seeing here in the reports that uh, we, are, we are doing. Um, the results of this study, as it was mentioned, uh, it won't be just a study and then we close and we forget about it. There, there, there are some uh, ideas for the future and we will for sure take them on board. So we have seen that um, we started some work on innovative public services, looking at how uh, indeed this is being done uh, across Europe. And um, from the insights of this uh, report, we will continue that work. Uh, legal interoperability, as I mentioned, is, is really key in the, in the transformation, but also the organizational interoperability. And all these be include, be, will be included in the future data Europe program that, uh, well, if everything goes right in the adoption phase, um, we'll start beginning of, of next year. But I wanted to also mention something um, where I, I also would invite everybody to contribute, is that we, are, we just started the revision of the European Interoperability Framework. As you may have noticed on the way I was talking, um, uh, with this, this framework that covers all these aspects, um, so technical, semantic, but also uh, organizational uh, and legal, um, will be revised. We are uh, supposed to, to uh, provide the new version and the evaluation by end of next year. So we will go with uh, public consultation and collaborative approach. So I also would invite everybody to, to, to contribute to, to this um, uh, revision. And in any case, uh, this report will be one of the uh, inputs uh, for, for that. Um, also, uh, just to, to highlight perhaps uh, this uh, part on organizational structures and governance that has been really uh, 
put forward in the in the report. This is something that was already uh, recognized in the in the interoperability framework, but we need to perhaps um, reinforce it and um, uh, work a bit more on that. But also the innovation. And and here I would like to mention that indeed. Um, for some time, we were more looking at transformation of public service or uh, changes, just to put it there. But we kind of um, underestimate the power of innovation. And this is something that has been highlighted that we have seen now. And this is something that most probably we will have to add also in our framework. Also to see that these are things that have to be taken into account since the beginning. Um, another thing that also uh, um, uh, Gianluca mentioned, but I think it's, it's really also important to, to highlight, is the importance of public values. And as it was said, so uh, the technologies are, are there, they are evolving very fast. And we have to make sure that when we are adopting from a public uh, sector perspective, new, these new technologies, we we have in mind the public values and we are not only looking at, for example, the usual efficiency gains that we look always when we are transforming our um, public administrations, but that we go beyond looking at accountability, transparency, but not only as it was put on the table is on having really citizen centric or even citizen driven uh, services and also include them and have this collaborative approach for the design of policies that will uh, increase the inclusion and trust in in the in the public services and uh, finally just to to also leave some some time for for questions i i would like to to uh, thank uh, Gianluca for his dedication and the collaboration with the team um, he has been uh, really pushing and uh, I, I really thank him for, for his approach on being very inclusive in um, all the ideas that uh, were put on the table. Thank you very much and um, ready to, to, to discuss further on this topic. Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias, Natalia, also for your kind words. And uh, well, I, I think there are already many, many issues that uh, both brought to the to the table of Andrea, <laughs> uh, both from the local uh, and also the digital innovation part, including some questions. Uh, so maybe if you want to also give us your perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I uh, indeed have worked in the area of e-government and most recently working at the local level, smart uh, mobility, smart living, smart cities. And I'm very pleased that the local aspect has uh, made it uh, very very significantly to the study and indeed two of the case studies are very much focusing on the local level um, because i think cities have a, a um, an interesting role in when we're looking at the digital transformation uh, of public sector first of all not only because many of us or and also in the future by 2040 many of us will live in in cities but indeed the public services many of or most of the public services are delivered at local level so it's really the first um, encounter with public sector with the first encounter with public services for most of the citizens and therefore in a way uh, determine the, the image that public uh, sector and government itself creates with the vis-a-vis -vis the citizens and a major um, role player also in the creation of trust and legitimacy. It's also important for cities because of their structure, because of their size, that they actually uh, allow for experimentation and this kind of digital tools that you've mentioned and you've looked into require, of course, a lot of piloting and experimentation. And we see that many of the cities actually serve as a really good innovation hubs to test these, these essentially new digital solutions. And thirdly, I think uh, what uh, was just mentioned by Natalia, indeed, um, cities and particular smart cities which you could find many many different uh, definitions for what we see is that it's it's moving it's moved away from 
the focus on efficiency, even resource efficiency in the smart city context, and really looks at how digital tools, digital solutions can actually create a better quality of life, can create the public value that you talked about, can create the sustainability, both in terms of economic prosperity, but also in terms of environmental and climate perspectives for just a better quality of life for citizens. So I think it's a very good use case to also show how the digital transformation is much broader than just the efficiency gains. Um, I also, uh, when I looked at the date, of course, 2040, and thinking of smart cities, many of us would start uh, fantasizing about flying cars or, or drones delivering food or, or um, underground uh, uh, farms and so on. But one thing is for sure, and it comes across very much uh, from the, from the uh, study, is that this is a, uh, there's no turning back. So digitization is, is certainly there and it's going to stay. The COVID pandemic and its aftermath has demonstrated that it's accelerating. And also, as Cristiano said, it also brings, however, forward a number of risks and perhaps even showcasing how we need to be more aware of these risks. And I, I would like to point out that this is very, very much appreciated in the study that it brings forward very um, realistically this uh, notion that we need to see that in an accelerated phase of digital transformation, how we ensure that those kind of values, those kind of principles that we've put forward, in particular in Europe, remain to be adhered to. And in the, particular in the, in the local context, many of you may know that uh, uh, local um, government uh, representative stakeholders of smart cities have put together a declaration uh, more recently uh, called calling for a European way of the digital transformation of cities and communities. And many of these principles that have been brought forward earlier are uh, echoed there, such as a citizen-centric approach, an ethical approach to AI, a city-driven uh, digital transformation, and so on. So I'd like to uh, conclude on what exactly we are focusing on in terms of local administrations, digital transformation, smart cities at a European level. And I have three points to make, not seven, but I hope that's, that's going to that's gonna just uh, make it uh, even more crisp. So the first uh, element is focusing on helping to implement interoperable urban platforms. And this was already pointed out earlier. Indeed, in a local context, it's even more important that citizens have a very much um, uh, integrated kind of uh, perception of the services they're given. And this can be allowed by uh, helping to integrate different platforms focusing on different parts of the administration. Uh, you mentioned the, the discussion between platformization or network government, and certainly the siloed approach would have these checks and balances. But what we do see, however, is that for many uh, uh, smart city solutions, and, and, and uh, not only on the government side, but also on utility company side, an integrated approach can be very much uh, um, facilitated by these kind of interoperable urban platforms. And we're hoping to uh, support their implementation through the forthcoming Digital Europe program. The second element we're looking into is, of course, data and how to ensure, we've been talking about, uh, of course, helping to interconnect and get access to data between governments. Now we've been talking about the once only principle. Uh, we've been also talking a lot about opening up some public sector data in order to uh, facilitate um, innovation or, or increase transparency. And that's what we're also seeing is that there's a great advantage in, in particularly sharing some of the data that may not be public for everyone, may not be uh, just for the public administrations, but could be very helpful uh, for cities to actually manage their utilities, their waste, their traffic, but essentially they're in, in public hands because of the structure of, of, of cities. And so we're looking at the creation of so-called European data spaces. You may have heard of under the data strategy in Europe, and one of them will focus on the green uh, deal data space to help um, uh, the, 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 the digital um, infrastructure for, for environment. And within that, we're looking at what it would mean for local uh, level. How could we have a local ecosystem of data for uh, local digital services that are not con uh, confined to one city only, uh, but could benefit from the intercollection of these data spaces. And the third element is really on the application side, and here I, I refer to, for example, AI-driven applications, and as you say, for example, the analytical, predictive analytical capabilities. And what we're looking into is the notion of digital twins. Uh, that is a very interesting um, application area 
for cities, for some parts of cities, for some uh, maybe domains in a city that could allow uh, using the data that's been collected at local level through sensor citizens and so on to actually create some scenarios like you've done here and to be able to play with that and inform the decisions of public sector. So I think there's a lot of relevance for us. We really appreciate the, the, the in-depth of the study, the scenarios and the findings. And just to congratulate again the study team, we find there's lots of uh, food for thought for the local level. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, I think this also brings uh, uh, very nicely to, to, to Barbara, because of course some of these issues that uh, we've been discussing, uh, I'd say in Europe, are very much uh, also um, of concern at the international level. Uh, so, and the OECD has always been also pioneering. I remember from the government imperative report in 2003 and many other interesting uh, uh, publications. And um, so Barbara can give us also a flavor of the important um, work she's, uh, she's been leading. Last year, a report on data-driven uh, public sector that we refer to amply in our report, but also the recent uh, our data um, uh, analysis. I think uh, there are very, very interesting uh, issues and maybe also going beyond uh, the border of Europe. So Thank you, Jeruk. I think so much. And hi, everyone. And I also would like, um, uh, not in a rhetoric way, but in a, in a sincerely meant way, like my colleagues, to thank you, Jaluka and JRC, for having enabled us to be part of this conversation because this is the study and today's webinar is just the end of a conversation and a long engagement we had in the past, in the past few years. And I want to thank you in, in particular as well. We've been on each other for quite some time, working together on these themes for quite some time. And I'm sure that this will continue because we have them close to our, to our heart. Um, and I, I, in, in my comments, I actually would like to build on a number of comments that have been made by the colleagues, starting by the COVID-19 pandemic situation and what this has meant and what this is meaning still for governments when it comes to the use of digital technologies and data. I personally disagree strongly, and I think my team does as well, because whenever I speak about the work we do, it's not just Barbara, it's the whole team behind Barbara as well. Um, we've tried to take away um, our position from discussing about the COVID-19 having pushed for an acceleration. We don't think that the COVID-19 has pushed for any acceleration. The COVID-19 has unveiled the need to take some of those urgent decisions and priority decisions that governments should have taken since a few years, if not a few decades ago. Andrea spoke about the once only principle. Natalia already spoke about the interoperability, not only technical. Those are things all of us, the UN, the European Commission at different levels, the OECD, and the, the, the regional banks have been talking about for at least 10 years. So I think the COVID-19 has demonstrated, like Cristiano also said, that digital and data provide opportunities, but also important challenges for governments in a situation of crisis, but not only to be able to keep designing policies and services uh, which are valuable to deliver services and also to um, change the operations, what we call within the OECD, the operations within the public sector. So we talk about so much breaking down silos. This is not a novelty. It's just that the COVID-19 has demonstrated that you cannot deliver integrated services unless inside you are cross-cutting, you are horizontal, you move away from some both vertical models. And this is a little bit the approach that we have been adopting in the past few months in trying to assess and analyze the practices that governments have put in place uh, to try to understand how ready they were, because I think the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the digital maturity intended as the capacity to, from one moment to another, be digital, internally in the delivery of services in the interactions with the, the users uh, means for government in terms of responses so to what extent governments were actually ready meaning they had the skills in place the policies in place the infrastructure in place the laws in place to be able to design responses that included the use of data and digital uh, to what extent they have been capable to actually design recovery strategies which are longer term strategies uh, to look at the day after tomorrow and after today and to what extent they have made this part of their long-term public sector reforms. And we will be pro producing a couple of papers that are coming out in, in September. One focused on digital, one focused on open data, and the other one focused on open and innovative government to see also how governments have been connecting the dots. 
uh, as they try to be innovative, as they try to use open government policies and uh, doing this, putting data and technology at the core of their, of their actions. So that was the first point I wanted to make because we are also much about accelerating, but as I really think that the COVID-19 has demonstrated the role of the government is essential. Um, it's, it's important to collaborate with the ecosystem, but the state and the government are the primary providers of core government services, even when they deal with these emergencies. This requires a government that needs to be agile, that needs to be resilient, that needs to be responsive. And I think we all agree that this is a government that needs to be digital in the pure sense of the term. And, and I, this builds a little bit also on the work that we've been doing that you, Jaluka, also mentioned in relation to open data. So the, the policy paper that analyzes the, the results of the last um, Our Data Index that we published in 2019 actually demonstrate that yes, governments have taken uh, important steps to improve accessibility of data, availability of data and reuse. Many of the formal requirements are now part of national legislations or policies, for instance, the open by default, opening up of data, but there are still important efforts that need to be made when it comes to enabling the access and the sharing of the data and the reuse of the data, focusing on the ecosystem, meaning what data do, we need, do users need. It was really breaking our heart in my team when in the wake of the, of the explosion of the pandemic in, in March, we were talking with some open data teams in governments and they were saying, you know what, there are so many data sets that would be valuable if we could re release them now and our minister is not giving the green light. So in that sense, we were very sad to see that the evidence that we had in the Our Data Index were actually, was actually correct, meaning there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to reach out to the ecosystem, which is the one that is needed to reuse the data to produce the value. And in that sense, um, there are, uh, this, this is very much connected to other pieces that we worked on, like the uh, data-driven public sector report, look at that you mentioned, in one aspect in particular, the data governance. Because if you, for all those who looked at the, that report, for us, data governance means not only the policies, the laws, the institutional setup, but also the measures taken to ensure that data is actually seen as a strategic asset, which means the data architecture is in place, the data infrastructure is in place, but also how all this connects with the, the adoption of standards and the enforcement of, the, of the, all those standards so that in a way, we have all the different pieces of the puzzle to be able for government to use data as a key strategic asset, which means using data to come up with uh, services that better respond to the needs of the, of the users, um, use of data to anticipate needs, but use of data also to um, assess how they are performing in the delivery of uh, policies and, and services. And this needs to be linked to the third element, which is the trust. So there's no, uh, there's no, real gain that can come after the use of data unless the use of data is uh, trusted by the public. And uh, there are a number of governments reasons right now that are looking at the development of ethical uh, frameworks that support the use of data within the public sector, but also link it to the use of AI. Because I think that the other point I wanted to make is that the, the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated to what extent the silo way of dealing with issues also applies to policy making. So still many governments have digital government policy and public sector innovation policy and an open government policy and a service delivery policy. And now they're coming up with AI ministries, uh, which in some cases resemble the old ICT ministries. And in other cases are completely disconnected with those dealing with public administration issues and, and digital government issues. And um, in this sense, there are, uh, so I anticipate to, to close, uh, three pieces that are coming up also in the near future, in September, um, we are about to release the Digital Government Index that in our view, and he, this responds a bit uh, to some of the questions around measurement, in our, in our view should help a little bit ground on data, what we've been talking about for the past few years, which is the shift from e-government to digital government that we included in the OECD recommendation on digital government. And that, as you know, for us, is not just a terminological issue, but really uh, requires a paradigm shift, which is important. So the index to be released in early September, which right now it's presented in a pilot version, so that we make sure that governments become familiar with it, has six um, indicators. And the six indicators correspond to the digital government policy framework, 
that will also be in its full entirety described together with the, the index in a document that will be released in September as well. And these six dimensions, um, only one has the word digital in it, which is digital by design. The, others one, the other ones are being data driven, being able to act as government as a platform, being user driven, being proactive and being open by default. So for us, really, the whole idea is that the digital maturity is not much about using technology, but creating the environment that also Andrea and Natalia and Vincenzo were talking about, which can support a meaningful use of, uh, of data and of uh, technologies. And last but not least, as you know, within the OECD, we like a lot to, to support the work with some normative tools. And we are working on a new recommendation on enhanced access and sharing of data, which precisely has the goal also to bring all the stakeholders around the table, because often we talk about open data in governments and open data within the private sector and open data within the scientific and research community. They were different, different themes, different policies, whereas this recommendation that hopefully will be adopted in 2021, we have the goal to say that if we really want to provide public data as a good a public uh, resource, we all need to come together from the different uh, parts of the ecosystem. And I stop here, Gianluca. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Barbara. And actually, I don't know if I can disclose this personal information, but double thanks as, a, as I know you, were, uh, you are on holiday today, so you accepted to be here. Despite that, that shows the commitment that uh, I mean, uh, many of us uh, uh, have on this. And also I want to thank uh, Fran uh, Vincenzo because he, uh, he told me he must to leave. Uh, uh, I mean, okay, he has to meet the minister, so he preferred a minister to us. So, but uh, also um, I know that there is, uh, there is a Zoom fatigue that uh, takes many, many, and so people uh, suggested not to go over a certain amount of time for the digital meeting. So I don't want to, to take longer, but maybe we should give the opportunity if someone wants to, to give a, make a comment or a question. Uh, so maybe we can have a, have a couple of, or otherwise maybe we can have a final. So, so it seems that nobody is- There is uh, a hand raised, I think, by okay. Marina Manzoni. Okay, Marina, uh, we can have a maybe 30 second question. Or comment? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Marina Manzoni, and I belong to the same unit as uh, um, Gianluca. Thanks a lot, Gianluca, for your efforts. Um, rather than a question, my qu it, it's a kind of comment or an invitation rather than a question. I'm very pleased to have learned that uh, we have moved from uh, efficiency gain to public values. Uh, and non-monetary gains, uh, which are, have their, their cons, like, for example, a digital gap for the elderly, but also the um, pros, uh, which is uh, a lot, especially in the local ecosystem, as uh, Andrea was saying. And I'm also pleased that we're talking about not more uh, of services rather than technologies, because technologies are just one component of the service, which is a more global, more it's a wider concept that involves many more stakeholders and dynamics and it's more complex than technologies and i'm also pleased that now we are going from global to local because as andrea said that's where the uh, services are delivered to most of the people so the local dimension is absolutely um, uh, high priority in the in this respect especially now uh, because there where is where we provide um, services and, and we have to grant uh, accessibility but inclusiveness more than, rather than accessibility so inclusiveness of provision of services to everybody and now we come to what's important to me which is the um, user-centric and citizen-centric approach in the sense that it is at local level where the um, calibration of the services happens and it's where the citizens have an active voice, as Gianluca said, an active participation. Uh, more and more we are seeing that citizen science, but now as we like to call it, citizens generating data uh, is becoming more and more important in the shaping of the services and also in the shaping of the instruments to deliver the services. And I believe, and I don't know whether you have this in mind for the next uh, research, um, let's say challenges, 
I believe that citizens generated data, including citizen science, will bear an important um, aspect, an important role in the future. I don't know what if anybody has something to, to say about this. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Marina. So, uh, well, of course, at JRC, we, we, uh, we are, um, uh, I mean, that is not, uh, let's say, my role to mention that, but there is a new work program for next year, and Marina knows on the uh, talking explicitly on digital uh, transformation of governance and public sector innovation. So um, many of you are uh, involved and uh, will be involved in this. So I'm very pleased that this uh, work uh, will continue um, in the future um, by other colleagues that I will take the lead uh, when I'm uh, leaving soon. Uh, now, um, uh, maybe uh, I can uh, give uh, to to each of you, uh, maybe a couple of minutes uh, to just uh, respond on these and maybe a final comment uh, from uh, from your side, especially more, say, on the future, not necessarily to the flying cars of 2040 uh, horizon, but maybe in the next uh, couple of, uh, of uh, years, so when uh, the Digital Euro program and maybe the COVID will be uh, um, will be uh, uh, something we will remind, remember, but will be over. So maybe if we can have uh, uh, Barbara, Andrea, and Natalia to conclude this uh, very uh, nice uh, and interesting uh, webinar uh, without uh, going maybe farther than uh, 440. So maybe we go in a, in a reverse sense, and maybe if Barbara, you want to say something, uh, then Andrea and Natalia, just to conclude the remarks. Yeah, very quickly. I really agree on the relevance of the local governance for two reasons. First of all, because that's the highest proximity to the people. And second, because I really think that change cannot happen unless we really overcome also the, the distance that sometimes we have from the central administration to the local administration. So I, I couldn't agree more with the comments that have been made on the, on the importance of taking a look, a very close look, and engage also the local levels of, um, of government. Thank you, Gianluca. Thanks. Andrea, this is for you. It's a served. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question, Marina. Um, indeed, so at the local level, as you will also recall already in the Italian declaration, the annex already mentions that there must be certain principles uh, uh, that should be recognized and taken into account when delivering services that are around user centricity. So I think that's that's already been the wish at least at national level and now we're just seeing that how it trickles down to all levels of government and what are the kind of means that can make it happen. So certainly that's a very important uh, aspect on the local side and I wanted to say this earlier but I didn't have a chance. We're also looking into some uh, indicators for the digital transformation at local level, the so-called local and regional in, um, digitization index, the LORDI, uh, that will look at uh, some of these aspects at local level. So hopefully that will also give a better understanding on what's really happening on the ground. As regards uh, citizen, citizen science, I think it's, it's absolutely um, necessary that that data that is ex very, very uh, useful and particular, for example, in the case of, of uh, monitoring uh, environmental indicators or, or climate change or other issues that happen at local level and have an impact on citizens' lives, I really see a, a, a necessity to actually make that part of if there is such a thing as a, as a, as a data space for local um, for cities, that that type of data source should also be taken into account as it can really uh, help improve, for example, decisions made or services uh, collected. So I think uh, we're making all the efforts to engage those stakeholders that uh, are involved in citizen science to be uh, able to bring the, um, the, that data also into the data space. And since you were asking for a last uh, thought, I, I really uh, like the comment of Barbara, and I think I, I start to agree with it, that it's perhaps not just acceleration, but it's more about actually bringing out that the role of government for certain uh, key services has now really been uh, uh, very much underlined. And I think this gives a new, uh, perhaps, uh, stimulus uh, for, for creating uh, a, a different type of relationship between government and citizens and trying to uh, underline how what are really the core services that government still offers and gives uh, perhaps a, a an alternative to all the kind of scenarios to show that certain solutions and services will eventually come from government. And this makes me think about this idea that uh, 
that uh, triggers my imagination on what this kind of new uh, social contract may be in the future between government and citizens that Hobbes uh, started and Rousseau and many others in the past. So I'll stop here. Thanks, Andrea. And uh, well, before to give the, 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 the last words to Natalia, that somehow is also the owner of this study, as, uh, as it has been said at the beginning, this was uh, initiated within the framework of the Elise Action of the ISA Square program. And actually, also want to thank uh, George uh, Lobo, that's been uh, very quiet, but he's been our uh, main, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, guardian from, from uh, Brussels in this case, but also the other colleagues, uh, and you cannot mention all from Connect and uh, from JRC. So, um, I'm, I mean, just to conclude, yeah, ciao, George. And uh, so, um, Natalia, if you want to, 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 to conclude, and then uh, I think uh, we can also uh, leave them. And uh, as it was at the beginning, this uh, webinar has been recorded, so there will be a possibility to, to maybe look at it again and think about the future uh, future activities that will be, um, let's say, implemented as a continuation of these and other stream of research and policy action. Thank you. Thank you, Gianluca. I, I would like just to, 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 to perhaps complete on what uh, just Barbara and, and Andrea said, because I think also with the COVID crisis, we indeed look at um, um, so what could be or what can be the role of, of, of governments? We have seen also the, um, the balance that is needed between central and local governments. Uh, so, so this is something that I, I think has, um, we have to look at the lessons learned from how, how this crisis has been managed uh, from this perspective, because I think there are, there are some advantages and moving fully to local because we are closer to the cities and we should not reinvent the wheel in each small city here and there, but we have to work together. And I, I would like to thank you for, for the approach to, to this webinar and the whole report, because I think this brings in indeed this, this change in, in mentality and here we had uh, the UN, the OECD and Commission and many uh, different representatives and I think that more and more what we are trying is also trying to put together the information or the solutions that we have seen here and there and improving them instead of each time having to reinvent uh, uh, the wheel. So I think th this is key and this has started and we have to continue in this way. So um, I would like that uh, just to say that indeed we, we have to continue this uh, collaboration that this will change not only uh, the way we uh, do this kind of uh, effort and, and reports, but also the way we deliver the services, because I think that this all is uh, related. So uh, thank you very much. And I think there is a way uh, uh, for the future, uh, very interesting uh, now. Thank you very much. So thank you. And then, I mean, I just seek uh, from Francesco, Simon, but I think, uh, and Lorena, that has been, uh, they've been, uh, let's say, co-organizing this event. Uh, so thanks uh, to, to them and to everyone. And uh, I'm sure we will see again soon, uh, definitely online and hopefully also in person uh, uh, somewhere uh, in the world. <laughs> so thanks a lot and uh, see you in the future.